Hello everyone and welcome to the second of five webinars in our Further Learning in Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. My name is Jen Nolan and Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria is pleased to be presenting this series for Victorian primary and community health staff on behalf of the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services. The project we are undertaking for the department not only includes the webinar series but also the development of an online learning and development resource where the webinar recordings and other practice tools and resources will be available on our website in coming months. Today is World Arthritis Day and quite appropriately today's webinar will focus on the management of osteoarthritis. Before introducing our presenter however I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar please refer to the message box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by the webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you are listening via the phone you will notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal so don't be concerned. Also whilst our presenter will answer questions after the completion of her presentation you can actually type questions at any time. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute because we will aim to uh, finish strictly at 1.30 p.m. I'd also be very grateful if participants could take a moment at the end of the webinar to actually complete the exit survey. It won't take you very long and the information is very valuable to us. Our presenter for today is Associate Professor Rana Hinman. Rana, Rana is a physiotherapist and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow at the Centre for Health Exercise and Sports Medicine within the Department of Physiotherapy at the University of Melbourne. Her area of research is knee osteoarthritis in particular the development and evaluation of non-surgical and non-drug treatments for the condition and conduct of clinical trials to test the effects of new treatments. She has a large body of peer-reviewed papers and has received over $4 million worth of research funding for her work, including both NH and MRC and ARC support. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Rana. Thanks very much, Rana. Thanks, Jen. We'll begin, um, I'll just put up an opening slide there with some relevant disclosures that the audience can be aware of for, that's related to some of my work. But moving fairly quickly into what I'm hoping to cover for this webinar and there's actually quite a lot of information and what I'd uh, like to point out is that the slides will be available to, to the audience so some of the slides will move through fairly quickly and so you'll be able to refer back to those slides for further information later. But to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about today I'll cover off on what is OA, talk a little bit about the typical clinical presentation and diagnosis of osteoarthritis and then fairly quickly moving into what are the principles of good care for the person with OA. Talking in particular about a biopsychosocial approach, a person-centred approach and then touching on what the current clinical guideline recommendations are and some of the evidence behind those. And then I'd like to finish off with highlighting quite a few or a number of common myths and misconceptions that many of you may actually be aware of but often your um, patients will, will talk to you about and I think are really important for, for us in um, good care of the person with osteoarthritis. So moving on, what is OA? OA is a complex disorder of synovial joints. It's considered a clinical syndrome primarily of joint pain but also accompanied by functional limitation that can range from mild functional limitation up to quite severe restriction and culminating in impairments in quality of life. It is the most common form of arthritis and one of the important things to remember about OA is that it's considered a disorder of the entire joint organ and in, in, the, in times gone by we used to think of OA as primarily a disorder of the cartilage and now we know that 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 is not the case and that it really is a clinical syndrome affecting the entire joint organ. A number of common sites for osteoarthritis. Although it can occur in any synovial joint, frequently we see it in the CMC joints of the thumbs, the DIP joints of the fingers, the hips and the knee and it's important to point out that at the knee that osteoarthritis can occur in both the, the tibiofemoral joint compartments and also the patellofemoral joint and in particular patellofemoral joint OA is quite common and commonly occurs with tibiofemoral joint disease. It can also occur in the facet joints of the spine but as you can see from my little diagram there 
most of the research that we that um, that a lot of my talk is based on and certainly that informs current contemporary management of OA is based on research coming from people with knee or hip osteoarthritis so that's where the bulk of research lies Let's have a little bit of a look at the prevalence of osteoarthritis and we know it is a really common disorder. This is some data that's come from the Global Burden of Disease 2010 study and what you can see that I have plotted there is the, the males, uh, the, the prevalence in males in the top graph and females in the lower graph and although it's quite a busy slide, it plots the data across the different regions. What we can see, it's a little tricky to see there but the red squares represent data from the Australasian region. What we know from this study is that NEOA prevalence increases with age and peaks at around the age of 50 years affecting about almost 5% of females and 2.8% or almost 3% of males so it really is a very common disorder. If we look at hips, and again this data is coming from the, the Global Burden of Disease study, again males on top and females below, what we see is that hip OA is less common than knee osteoarthritis, affecting almost 1% of females and 0.7% of males. And unlike osteoarthritis where we see the prevalence sort of peaks a little bit earlier, what we see here is a consistent relationship with prevalence of hip osteoarthritis increasing consistently with age. Hip and knee OA has been ranked as the 11th highest out of 291 conditions, the 11th highest contributor to global disability in the Global Burden of Disease study. So it really is a significant and major cause of disability both here in Australia and around the world. If we look a little closer to home and look at some of this data that was published by Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria a couple of years ago and have a look at the prevalence of OA in Australia. You can see in the, the red box there um, what the, this table shows the prevalence of OA across the different age groups. We can see males in this column here and females, the, the number with the prevalence here and the overall prevalence in this far right hand column. We see that the data is fairly consistent in that a prevalence of 8.6% of the total population in Australia has some form of osteoarthritis. So again, really highlighting the, the burden of disease in this country as well. And the economic burden, not surprisingly, is, is quite significant. This is a, another chart looking at the total health costs by condition in 2012 and what you can see here is this blue piece of this pie chart is related to osteoarthritis with almost 41% of total health costs in this country in 2012 being attributed to the problem of osteoarthritis. So it poses not only a significant personal burden for patients in, with respect to disability but quite a significant economic burden on society as well. And if we look at those costs in 2012 they are estimated to be almost $4 billion in Australia due to OA alone. What causes osteoarthritis? It's actually a really complex condition and we're not going to talk, we're not going to delve into the intricacies of the pathophysiology but essentially osteoarthritis can be considered an imbalance between cartilage breakdown and cartilage synthesis. In the body there's an ongoing attempt at, at, at cartilage repair and what we see is OA tends to occur when that cartilage breakdown tends to overwhelm the processes that, that undergo cartilage synthesis. There is no single cause and the exact etiology is unknown. However, there are a host of biological and mechanical factors that can culminate in the development of OA and I think this is a nice slide that sort of depicts those. Where over here on the left we see a number of factors that are known to, to increase an individual's predisposition to OA. Factors such as age and genetics and, and systemic factors such as obesity. And over on the right a range of biomechanical contributors of which the most common are um, particular Particularly if we think of the knee joint, a history of previous knee joint injury is a major factor. 
joint overload, which is often occurring um, in certain occupations. So we know, for example, um, that farmers have quite a high predisposition to hip osteoarthritis in particular, but also factors that contribute to joint instability all lead to abnormalities in joint biomechanics and in combination with these factors that predispose someone to OA, what we start to see is a cascade of biochemical pathways that lead on to the core, to osteoarthritis and d depending on these factors, this can influence the site of osteoarthritis as to which joint is involved but also the severity as to whether it's a mild form of OA up to a quite severe form. Obviously there's a range of other factors that can influence the, this process as well and these include psychosocial and psych socioeconomic determinants. Comorbidities will also have play quite a, a, a role here as well in determining how much pain an individual will experience and the extent of disability and distress that an individual experiences as well. And in a, in, in a feedback loop here we see that these factors can certainly influence this, this cascade of events that occur. So the pathology, we see a range of different pathologies. We see localised cartilage loss, we see remodelling of the adjacent bone, we see associated inflammation and changes in the ligaments and tendons around the joint. We see varying degrees of accompanying muscle weakness in the, in the local musculature but certainly if uh, the condition's been present for a long time and a, a patient has quite a, a a degree of physical dysfunction and disability, that muscle weakness can become more extensive. We can see localised joint malalignment and, and particularly um, that's common at the knee joint, particularly accompanying tibiofemoral joint disease. So a whole range of pathological processes which you can see here why OA really is considered a disorder of the whole joint complex rather than just cartilage loss when you look at that list of varying um, pathological features that can accompany the condition. And as I said, alluded to at the, the beginning, this really is a complex biopsychosocial disorder where we see a range of biological um, factors which I've talked about there, joint damage, dysfunction, altered biomechanics which can lead to changes in gait and other functional biomechanics inflammation, laxity and increasingly we're also beginning to understand that a range of somatosensory abnormalities can can be present. But the other uh, equally important are the psychological factors that are also associated with this condition and these are not limited to but can include some of these factors that I've listed on the slide there such as reduced self-efficacy, altered health beliefs, helplessness, depressions really common in people with osteoarthritis, poor coping skills, stress and anxiety are, are common and pain catastrophizing as well. And related to that are a range of socioeconomic factors that can influence these psychological factors and can influence the pain experience that a person can understand can can be experiencing. And I think it's really important to often we think about osteoarthritis as being a condition affecting older people but as I've shown you in those earlier slides it certainly affects younger people as well. So we need to think about relationships, family environment but particularly vo vocational aspects and work stress because this isn't just a condition that affects people of retirement age. There are a lot of young people working with osteoarthritis and they, they have a, a unique set of needs and, and impacts on their individual condition as well. So if we think about the typical clinical presentation of the patient with OA, I guess the one thing that characterises it is that there's extreme variability in how patients present. And this can be between individuals but also between the different joints within the same person who might have OA at multiple joints. So I'm sure you've all seen um, patients with um, who might come to you with x-rays and they might have x-rays of both knees and I've certainly looked at x-rays of one knee where they're really really terrible um, x-ray changes in one knee joint but very mild changes in the opposite yet it can often be that the pain with the, the knee with the very mild changes is the, is the joint that's actually causing the most problems for one person yet not, to, not the case with another individual. And I 
the main thing that I would really like to highlight here, which hopefully you can see from the, the different photos I've put there, is that OA can affect anybody. It can be particularly common or it can affect younger people who've had in a sporting age who've had past past injuries, so particularly at the knee. We can see older age, you know, in people who've retired, but certainly younger people who are still working and raising families. So really a very variable clinical presentation. And as I've already alluded to, it can affect the person in a number of ways. Typically we see pain and physical impairments that are resulting in, a, in various functional limitations. And the, the degree or variation of psychosocial fa factors or issues that may be present in an individual will help dictate the degree or severity of pain and also the functional limitation experienced. And all of these will culminate in a lower quality of life in in people with osteoarthritis. But if we have a look at the typical presentation, and this is um, based on um, a, a study that was published a number of years ago, there's usually a, a series of common symptoms that patients report. These are usage related pain, so pain that gets worse with use of the, the affected joint. Pain that's often worse towards the end of the day. Pain that's often relieved by rest. With people with knee osteoarthritis, they may often report a feeling of giving way or buckling or that the knee just doesn't feel like it's going to support them anymore. Typically, people with OA will report only mild morning um, stiffness or stiffness after inac inactivity. Often people um, will, if there's a time limit put on it, many um, leading bodies that are involved in classifying or diagnosing osteoarthritis will say that this is stiffness that lasts for less than 30 minutes. And typically, patients are reporting impairments in function. On examination, there's usually a range of, again, common um, signs that you might see when you examine a person with OA. These include crepitus on movement, often um, painful or restricted movements, whether they be active or passive movements, but usually the, the person will report pain and restriction with movement. Often bony enlargement can be observed. Typically, these people will have an absent or only a modest effusion, so they won't have a really grossly big fat swollen joint, maybe a mild effusion or, or none at all. Deformity is often present, um, particularly if the, the condition has persisted for a longer period of time. And if we think about the, the joints where we often will see deformity, it will often be the, the small joints of the hand and fingers or the knee joint where we will typically see um, a varus or valgus malalignment, for example. Again, um, there may be evidence of instability at the knee joint in a patient with knee osteoarthritis and also periarticular tenderness might also be present on, um, on presentation. But if you look at these signs and symptoms, you'll see that some of these signs and symptoms can often be present with other conditions as well. So there's nothing, there's no one one symptom that you can, or sign that you can often hang your hat on for for, osteoarth for diagnosing osteoarthritis. If we have a look at how, um, what are the, the recommendations for reaching a diagnosis of OA and really current recommendations are showing um, and current guidelines are emphasising more and more that a clinical diagnosis of osteoarthritis is possible based on a clinical examination alone and what we know about the background prevalence of osteoarthritis from society. And so this is a nice study from a number of years ago that looked at the um, probability of having OA based on these different signs and symptoms that you can see in the chart. And so if a, a person presented with persistent knee pain, they had a 20% probability of actually having radiographic OA. But that probability increases when you add a symptom of morning, of morning stiffness of limited duration and again, another symptom of the, the person reporting impairments in function. If you then go on to do a clinical examination and find evidence of crepitus, restricted movement and bony enlargement as well, you can see that there's nearly a 100% probability that that person will have radiographic osteoarthritis and that in fact there's really no need to do uh, um, any x-rays in many patients with OA based on a good clinical examination of the person. 
And so that's exactly what the clinical guidelines recommend. You'll see throughout this presentation that I'm going to refer to quite a, a bit to the, um, these are one of the most recent guidelines and I will talk a little bit about them, a bit more about them later. But these are produced from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK and these were published only at the beginning of 2014. So they're some of the most up-to-date clinical guidelines on osteoarthritis and they're, they're available on the, the website at, at the, the NICE website but also so um, they, I believe, and Jen can tell us a little bit more at the end, but I believe some of these resources will also be available from the Arthritis Victoria website um, in a little while after this series of presentations are um, concluded and are, are uploaded there. But if we have a look at those guidelines, NICE recommend and advise that osteoarthritis can be diagnosed clinically without investigations if a person is 45 is aged 45 and over, has activity related joint pain and has no morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes. They do go on to advise that you, clinicians should be aware that atypical features such as a history of trauma, prolonged morning stiffness or a rapid worsening of symptoms or a hot swollen joint may actually indicate some other diagnoses that we need as clinicians to be aware of and they're important differential diagnoses that one needs to consider. When are investigations appropriate for someone with OA? Well it can be to confirm a differential di diagnosis which may be related to some of those factors I just alluded to on the previous slide or to exclude another condition or for a person that has a very unusual clinical presentation. MRI is only useful for very rare differential diagnoses and in fact um, we're starting to see an, an overuse of MRI for um, knee osteoarthritis in particular and it may be this overuse of MRI that's helping to drive up arthroscopy rates because typically we will see um, degenerative changes within the menisci of the knee joint on MRI and that's often leading to inappropriate use of um, surgical procedures that we actually know don't, don't change outcomes for patients with OA. Now let's have a look at some of the principles of good care for managing a person with OA. It really should be a person-centred approach rather than a rest for managing the condition of OA and hopefully that, that message is going to come through fairly loud and clear in the next few slides and again if you refer to the NICE guidelines they're very um, also very strong on a person-centred approach to the management of OA and it should be a holistic approach to care where we're considering medical, social and the psychological needs of the individual person. This must include their ability to carry out their ADLs, their employment and vocational activities, family commitments as well as their leisure activities and hobbies and so it really does require a tailored approach to treatment because a younger person of working age is going to have very different needs to a person who's retired and no longer responsible for caring for small children. And it really is useful to think of a biopsychosocial model of health such as the, the WHO framework for um, classifying um, a, a model of health care and disease and I'll go through that a little more in this slide. So if we have a look at the WHO International Classification of Functioning Disability in Health which is what you can see here in this slide, I think it really quite nicely can highlight why we need to consider a very holistic approach to a person with, with osteoporosis arthritis. For those of you who may not be familiar with this framework we can see that you can have the disorder or disease here that will manifest as impairments in body functions and structures, activity limitations and restrictions in participation and a range of contextual factors such as individual or environmental factors can influence all of these levels um, as you see here. And if we take an example of osteoarthritis, what we can see here is that it can manifest very differently for some people. Some people may have more um, impairments in the muscular system for example or we can have more radiographic changes at the joint level that we can see on x-ray here or biochemical changes at the cellular level. 
But these can lead to activity limitations in climbing stairs or walking for certain individuals and may lead to participation restrictions such as being unable to help mind grandchildren, being unable to get out to, to participate in activities such as going to the theatre where there might be a number of levels of stairs to climb or, bowl, or bowling activities as you see here. A whole range of environmental factors might come into play, which may be where um, the person lives. It's well, well established that people in remote areas versus metropolitan areas may have access to different services um, and support networks can play a role. And we know that personal factors such as education level and individuals' coping abilities and their, certainly their different jobs can also feed into how this one condition of osteoarthritis will manifest very differently across individuals. So I think thinking about the, the um, condition in, in the way of the ICF framework can be really useful when, um, when speaking with individual patients with the disease. Principles of good care should include therapeutic, should be around a therapeutic relationship that is very much based on shared decision making. So it's a mutual decision between the healthcare provider and the person with OA. We should be trying to encourage positive health seeking behaviours that are very relevant to that person's individual goals and ideally promoting self management because this is a chronic disease with no cure. So we want to be able to aim to promote self management and reduce a reliance on drug therapies. And so very important principles about a person centred approach include good communication and collaborative goal setting. This is just a nice, um, uh, look it's a bit of a busy algorithm but I think it's quite a nice algorithm that I thought might be useful to some people. Again this, this is from the NICE clinical guidelines and they produced this algorithm as an aid for clinicians to help prompt questioning when, when discussing um, how OA is impacting an individual person to use these as little prompts for certain areas that you might want to explore as part of a holistic assessment. So for example, you may not need to explore quality of sleep with all, pa all persons but if, it, if, that's tri if the discussion that you have with a patient triggers that, that's certainly an area you might want to talk about. But this is just a, a nice useful one for, well if we're wanting to explore how the social factors are impacting OA. We might want to ask questions about the effects on life and what their individual lifestyle expectations are and then following on to exploring individual hobbies and family duties and ADLs. Or if we're thinking about exercise, we might want to be exploring their the person's attitudes to exercise. So it's quite a useful little tool that um, some of you may find helpful in your clinical practice. But three key areas that NICE recommend in um, a, a person-centred assessment are particularly employment and social activities, exploring comorbidities and that's particularly because we know that comorbidities are so common in people with osteoarthritis and that's particularly because osteoarthritis does is more prevalent as the population ages and it's more, pre or more prevalent in people who are overweight and obese and we know that there's a lot of comorbidities that can go hand in hand. Um, and it can raise particular issues for, de for sorting out the most appropriate management plan and particularly um, issues around polypharmacy. So it is a very important area of a, of a person-centred assessment. And as well as that, questioning around support networks and that's because we know that carers can help provide and support a person with osteoarthritis but also because we know that carers often need support themselves and there's a real risk of isolation for people with OA if they don't have any support network and it might be a very important management goal for some people who don't have a readily available support network that that to helping to establish that and linking them into appropriate support services may be in fact the number one goal early on in managing particular people with OA. A, cl and, um, a clinical assessment should also inc incorporate an assessment of function. So for example, with pe for people with lower limb osteoarthritis, assessments of gait and other lower limb activities. 
an examination of the joints above and below because it may be that some pain can be referred from other joints and may not be arising from the joint um, or necessarily arising in total from the joint affected by OA. Um, and it may also be that the joint pain may be more a feature of a widespread pain disorder rather than a localised pain arising from the local osteoarthritis. And at it's important in that regard, therefore, that we look for other treatable periarticular sources of pain because that can influence our subsequent management as well. Now there are a range of assessment tools available to assist um, clinicians. Aussie provide a number of these and I've put the, the website at the bottom of this slide. These include a number of patient related questionnaires for assessing pain and function that I've listed here on this slide. And also on the Aussie website and for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with Aussie, that's the Osteoarthritis Research Society International. They recommend a number of physical performance measures for people with lower limb osteoarthritis in particular that can help um, provide an objective measure of function for clinicians so that you can as a ready means of reassessing over time and monitoring progression. And so these measures that you can see here are all available on that website including video clips and quite detailed instruction manuals. So I encourage you to have a look there later on. Then it's appropriate to formulate a management management plan and it really should be agreeing on a plan with the person with osteoarthritis rather than the clinician telling the person what the best plan is and involving the family members may be appropriate. As I've said, considering comorbidities is really important here and that will come through a little bit further as I go through the individual treatment um, recommendations. But it's very important to discuss risks and benefits of treatment options with the patient and to ensure that information is understood. So we really need to make sure we're communicating at a level that each individual can understand the information we're giving them and that they, they can understand the risks and benefits and to agree as a team on individualised management strategies. I alluded to clinical guidelines, there, there's a whole range of them out there and this slide just summarises those for you and most of those are available freely at the individual websites of these organisational bodies. You'll see from over here that some are specific to hip and knee OA where for example the American College of Rheumatology also include hand OA and there's a EULA guideline for hand OA although that's getting a bit outdated now and you can have a look at those at your leisure later on. But if we look at the, the NICE recommended treatments for OA, what we see here is a core set of treatments that every person with OA should be having and these include three pillars, education, advice and information access, exercise that should incorporate strengthening exercise and aerobic fitness training and weight loss for people who are overweight or obese. And then what we see outside these core pillars are adjunct treatments that are seen to be adjunctive to these core treatments. We should not be managing someone with OA just with drug strategies alone. Drug strategies can have their place but these are supplementary and additional to these core strategies and then we see a range of other interventions around here. Now because of time limits I can't go through all of the evidence behind all of these treatments um, and certainly the NICE guideline is a very extensive document that summarises the most up-to-date evidence but I will touch on some of the evidence behind these core treatments because these are the essential ones for all patients. And just to highlight that there's not a lot of difference across the OA guidelines, this is the um, a, a summary of the guidelines that Aussie put out last year for people with knee osteoarthritis. And if I can draw your attention to the yellow box there, you can see that the core treatments for, for knee OA are exactly the same as the NICE guidelines where we have self-management and education advice, we have weight management for people who are overweight or obese and then then we have exercise that it may be land based or water based and should incorporate strength training. So if we look at the first pillar which is education advice and information, we need to make sure we're offering advice on those core treatment strategies and so we need to talk about the benefits of these treatments um, including um, 
the, the likely outcomes that will come from participating in physical activity and exercise and the importance of maintaining a healthy weight or losing weight for people who are overweight and obese. We need to be providing our, um, people with OA verbal and written information in a way that they can understand to enhance their understanding of the condition and its management and really importantly to counter misconceptions and I'll come back to those, some of those common ones at the very end of my presentation. And it's important to recognise that information sharing really should be an ongoing process rather than a single event. Dumping a lot of information on a person the very first time they're diagnosed with osteoarthritis, they will not be able to retain all of that information and so often it's about working out which is the most important information and advice to cover at a time and coming back and, and checking understanding and following up with questions at subsequent consultations over time. There's a whole range of consumer resources available out there but I just point you to some of those available from the Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria website. You can see a list of, of strategies there, there's brochures, there's patient stories, there's um, the musculoskeletal helpline, there's community activities and classes and events that many patients may benefit from. So you should have a look there for the, the types of resources that you can help connect patients with osteoarthritis into. Joint protection principles are often something we need to talk about when um, helping advise someone how to self-manage their condition. So these are, these are often principles that we as clinicians think are quite common knowledge and obvious but I think we need to bear in mind that many people actually, they're not common knowledge to a, to a person just being diagnosed and while some patients might work these out of their own accord over time, um, many people don't and so it's actually really important that we sit and, and have a good discussion with um, people with how to protect their joints and minimise flare-ups in their joint pain. A range of other self-management strategies that we can discuss that might work with some, um, work out which ones are the ones that appeal most to a, an individual. Um, and again, ensuring that we're targeting positive behavioural strategies and I'll talk a little bit more about exercise and weight loss in a moment but perhaps referring to self-management programs, encouraging and teaching people to use local heat or cold as an adjunctive treatment, considering referral for certain people to bracing and orthotic interventions for those who appear to have biomechanically driven pain or instability and for some people assistive devices for, for particular problems with ADLs may be appropriate as well. Exercise is really critical and the second pillar of core management and we really must be advising people with OA to exercise irrespective of their age, comorbidity, pain severity or disability and irrespective of what we see on the x-rays. And the ideal exercise program should include local muscle strengthening and general aerobic fitness or physical activity. And the reason this is a recommendation is because we've got lots of really good, strong, good, excellent, strong evidence um, including latest Cochrane reviews of exercise for the knee and for the hip as well as a couple of other really high quality um, meta-analyses and systematic reviews that were published over the last few years. And those of you who are interested in really reading um, that, that evidence, you can follow up on those papers. But the evidence is very clear. I've plotted here effect sizes um, for people with knee osteoarthritis and hip osteoarthritis immediately following an exercise program and followed up a few months after ceasing an exercise program. And what we can see is all of the meta-analyses show us very clearly um, that exercise is favoured over the control condition. And what we do tend to see is that the effects of exercise drop off after people stop their exercise program. So the really important message here is that we need to be not only getting people engaged with an exercise program but engaged with an exercise program over the long term and incorporating this into their daily life. It needs to become a habit. 
Importantly, and what many people with OA don't remember, understand is that exercise can be just as effective as drug strategies, which is just highlighted in this graph from a study a number of years ago. And I think that's a really important message that we need to educate our patients about is that exercise can yield similar benefits for pain and function as drugs, but with fewer side effects. And there are a number of, other than just pain and function, there are wide ranging benefits of exercise in osteoarthritis, including muscle strength, improved balance, cardiovascular fitness, and weight loss, and improvements in psychological state as well. So there really is a lot that we need to talk to our patients about with respect to exercise. And then we need to help them maintain their exercise. And so really choosing the exercise program is really critical and, and important. And really the choice of content should be informed by the patient preference. Most of the research shows that there's really no clear benefits over one type of program over another, which is really, is really important because it means that we can work with our individual patients to work out which type of exercise they're most going to stick with and, and adhere to. It's no good referring a person off for hydrotherapy if they hate hopping in the pool, aren't a strong swimmer and actually feel really awkward about being in a group or being seen in swimwear out, out in public. So we really need to work with the patient about what they, the types of exercise they've tried in the past, the types of activities they enjoy and what they're really interested in doing. Ideally though, both strengthening and aerobic components will optimise the outcomes. More contact with a health professional or a clinician or an exercise provider will tend to increase the effect size. So although the Cochrane reviews have shown no significant difference in studies when we, or in the meta-analysis when we look at seeing a clinician or having contact with a, a, a practitioner less than 12 times or over 12 times, there really is a trend there that with more monitoring and engagement with, a, with an exercise provider or a health professional, we tend to get better outcomes. And these contacts can be as simple as a phone call. It doesn't have to be a face-to-face -face visit. Similarly, one-on-one -on -one contact with a professional tends to yield greater effect sizes. However, again, meta-analysis shows no significant differences and even unsupervised home-based exercise programs are effective. And currently we have little evidence to guide the optimal exercise dosage in knowing how many repetitions or starting weights, for example. So I think this is a useful guideline that was produced a number of years ago by the American Geriatric Society for some general training parameters with respect to whether it's flexibility, strengthening or endurance exercise. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that table for some specifics if you're interested. As I've said, ongoing adherence really is essential and I think some sort of monitoring or ongoing supervision, and I'm not saying seeing someone every week, it might be that after you've got them exercising, some people just need a, a touch base once every six months just to see how they're going, maybe change the exercise program, maybe their goals are different or new problems have arisen, um, just to be able to individualise and help troubleshoot any barriers to exercise that people are reporting. And obviously referring people to the appropriate um, facilities in the community or health professionals if need be. There are a lot of barriers to exercise and this is just one little chart that conceptualises those as being intrinsic. So from a person's perspective, if they don't have the right knowledge or attitude or belief, if they don't actually believe that exercise is going to be beneficial, they won't, they'll be less likely to exercise ranging over to extrinsic factors which are probably um, quite com commonly encountered by many clinicians, so people who don't have the time or can't, can't readily travel to, to um, exercise facilities. So I think it's worthwhile keeping these factors in mind so that you can really individually work one-on-one -on -one to troubleshoot many of these issues at the beginning so that you can prescribe an exercise program that really does have the best chance of succeeding. Obviously a range of strategies to help people remember their exercises, written instructions, photos and video clips, trying to help the person incorporate exercise into their daily routines and things such as reminder systems or calendars, there's many apps now that can send um, SMS or reminders on, on the 
on an iPad or a phone. Um, sticky notes on the fridge can help. Exercise diaries and logbooks. And there's lots of pedometers and, and things such as a Fitbit that can help really with general physical activity. And it's really down to working out which of these strategies appeal to an individual person and then getting those in place. If we look at the third pillar of weight loss, as we know ob obesity is a, a modifiable risk factor for OA, especially at the knee, and that it's a, it's a really strong risk factor. And I think um, increased weight will typically precede the development of osteoarthritis. And importantly, a, an increase in BMI is also associated with more severe pain and disability. So really all overweight patients should be advised to lose weight. Usually weight loss is best achieved through a combination of dietary modifications and exercise and it may be that referrals to appropriate weight loss programs are needed whether it be um, something such as Jenny Craig or um, some of the, the more structured meal um, systems such as Light and Easy or even to um, a health professional such as a dietitian may be needed. Weight loss can benefit symptoms of pain and function at the moment we don't have any hard evidence that weight loss will actually result in positive effects on the joint, on, um, joint structure. And some of the, the most recent evidence in this area has come from the IDEA trial that was published in JAMA a couple of years ago where what you can see that this study looked at three different interventions which was diet alone, exercise alone and diet and exercise and they looked at um, primarily the effects of these interventions on inflammatory markers and joint structure but all and compressive force within the joint and also on um, symptoms. And what we tend to see here is that the, the combined effects of diet and exercise tend to result in the be better outcomes for the, based on this study. If we look at pharmacological management, um, the current NICE guidelines uh, advise that paracetamol and or topical NSAIDs should be used prior to moving on to oral NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitors which should be used prior to opioids. However, there is increasing concern about the safety of paracetamol and, in, and some of the latest evidence out this year is suggesting that there really are minimal short-term benefits of paracetamol for people with OA and it may be associated with harmful side effects to the liver and the gastrointestinal system. So we need to be really careful about how we're prescribing um, far, um, drug strategies for these patients and really in particular considering comorbidities which um, as, as I've already alluded to, OA does coexist with many other conditions associated with ageing and obesity and often particularly with prescribing pharmacological interventions we really need to think about the drug of choice relative, oh, sorry about my typo there, to toxicity, age and other conditions and so NICE recommend co-prescription with proton pump inhibitors um, for patients with osteoarthritis. What about referral for surgery? The guidelines are fairly clear in that we should not be referring patients for arthroscopy unless there's a clear, ev clear history and evidence of mechanical locking within the knee joint. The guidelines are also very clear that we need to make sure we give people adequate time and opportunity to try an appropriate course of all of the core non-pharmacological treatments prior to referring for surgery. However, when all of those options are exhausted, we should consider referral for um, patients who have joint symptoms with a substantial impact on their quality of life and that have really not responded to non-surgical treatment options. And it's important that we refer before the condition and those symptoms, those severe symptoms become prolonged and there's a really established functional limitation with severe pain. What about some of the common myths and misconceptions? I'm getting towards the end of my presentation so there'll be opportunity for questions. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions in um, people out there with OA. Some people will be quite proactive and, and ask about those upfront. 
many won't because many will consider some of these as just taken for granted and common knowledge. And so I actually think as clinicians and as people working with people suffering from joint OA, we really need to be on the front foot about talking with these about these myths, understanding what people believe about them and what their current knowledge base is because only then can we actually serve to try and educate them and improve their knowledge and therefore educate them to the benefits and you'll see that many of these will influence the outcomes of treatment. So there's a common myth from many people that they need an x-ray. X-rays are needed, you can't diagnose OA without an x-ray and that you need an x-ray to determine treatment. And um, that really is a very common myth and in fact we know that x-rays are actually expose people to radiation and ex in fact in many cases might, expose him, might be exposing people to unnecessary harm without, without giving any benefit because certainly x-ray severity has not not, um, does not dictate what type of intervention or how we'll manage OA and really serves little purpose because we know that signs and particularly pain is often fairly poorly correlated with what we see on x-rays. There's a common belief that OA is caused by ageing and it's often a fatalistic belief that there's nothing that can be done about it. That's a really important um, myth to bust up front if we want to be able to get patients and people to engage with self-management activities and be proactive about exercise and weight loss. There's a belief that OA will inevitably progress over time and again that's not the case. All people will not eventually need a joint replacement and in fact um, in many cases with symptoms particularly they, they can often um, resolve or improve a little bit over time although x-ray changes may not, cha may not improve. There's a belief that exercise will make OA worse. Um, and that it may only be suitable for people with mild symptoms. And I know, apologies for this is a bit of a busy slide but I think it's a nice one because it, it just documents some of the beliefs about people with neo -A to exercise where you can see here that the minority felt that exercise would work for anybody and that particularly for people with severe x-ray, the minority, ex, severe x-ray OA, the minority feel that exercise is beneficial. Well, you, we really need, there's no point prescribing exercises to people who have these sorts of beliefs. We need to spend the time educating people about that these just aren't true, that these facts just aren't true. Um, and so I've highlighted there in red the really common ones and again there's a belief often that actually it's activity and physical activity that may have caused the osteoarthritis in the first place and um, that there's safety concerns around exercise. So there's a lot of really common myths around, around exercise that we need to change. So to conclude, in summary, OA is a complex clinical syndrome. It has a very highly variable presentation but irrespective of how it presents, a person-centred and biopsychosocial and self-management approach is needed and three core pillars of treatment for all people with OA should include access to appropriate information and, and knowledge and education. Um, a plan to increase uh, physical activity and structured exercise and interventions for weight loss for overweight and obese people. And there's a range of other strategies that can be useful adjuncts that may include pharmacological inject, injections, physical therapies and biomechanical options as well that can help people. But I'll finish there and hand over to Jen so we can answer some questions. Thanks very much Rana, that was so comprehensive but so clear and um, particularly the sort of slide towards the end with regards to beliefs and attitudes, that's just such an important point to remember that um, really it's um, you know, hitting against your, your head against the wall if you can't Correct. sort of in a way engage with the person-centred approach and help to change some of those beliefs and attitudes. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions so if uh, anyone has any last minute questions please type them in now. We've got a couple of questions which I think in a way you've probably answered as, as we've gone along. There was a question quite early on in relation to um, uh, uh, just a sort of a scenario of when physiotherapy can no longer treat, offer treatment options for someone, for a female who's 87 years old. What are the treatment options for neck pain and functional uh, limitations when there's mild to moderate facet joint involvement? Now, if you've already feel like you've covered that with your comprehensive 
presentation then um, so any further comment Rana on that, that query? Yeah, look, I guess that look, I don't have anything any I don't have a magic bullet, I guess is the answer there. The principles for managing, although as I said there's been a heavy emphasis on um lower limb osteoarthritis, the principles are the same. It's about making sure I think um, that an appropriate course of physiotherapy has been covered because sometimes um, it may be that physiotherapy has relied more on, uh, has emphasised manual techniques or massage and perhaps only provided um, uh, less time and commitment to a really structured and progressive exercise program. So I'd encourage you to be looking closely at what the content of the program has been but also encouraging with the patient to look at how well they've adhered to that exercise program because it may be that the, the exercise has not had um, not had the amount of airplay that it really should have. But again there's not um, not anything extra to add there. This is really the, the current best practice approach and I, I'm presuming in that those cases that pharmacological strategies and as an adjunct have been explored. If they haven't been they certainly should be. And another question which in a way you mentioned those couple of um, reviews from the Cochrane collaboration um, and, a, and a couple of other publications around exercise. There was a query about is it effective to focus on one type of exercise at a time or to have a combined program? Yeah, th look that, that's, a, that's a really good question and on my slide, I'm not sure if I can just, I'll see if I can just go back to our, the slide um, where I put up the four front pages of the, I'm just going to go to, oh I'm sorry, I'm just, it's the one of the papers on here, uh, it's not going to there for you, oh, that's okay, the paper by um, Jewel, J-U-H-L as the first author, you'll see the little snapshot of it on my slide there. That was published last year and they did it there analysis is a little different to the others which is why often it can be a little frustrating for people when one systematic review concludes this and another concludes that. The authors in that study were very clear that they thought a program should be combined but on a particular day a patient should focus on for example, maybe today I just work on my strengthening exercises for this session so I can actually do them well and do them properly. Rather than in one exercise session I do six strengthening exercises, three stretching exercises and my walking program. There's, so some of the evidence in that systematic review supports that approach that yes we should have a comprehensive program but perhaps we work with the patient to working out which days of the week they're going to work on which particular aspect. So I think hopefully I've answered that question. It should include strengthening and aerobic activity but perhaps not all lumped in on the one day because it's very hard to get people to adhere to that. Thanks Rana um, uh, and I'll just remind people um, if there's any questions you have and we don't actually address those questions before the end of the webinar in about five minutes, Rana's happy to actually answer them offline and we can provide them to you at the time that we provide the recording of the webinar. Another question, any good resources for OA in the hand? Is splinting effective? Oh, look there's not, um, there's some limited research and splinting may be effective. I think but with respect to splinting it's something that really should be considered on an individual basis based on um, on the, the individual person and so a, re a referral to a qualified hand therapist whoever that um, whether that's an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist really really is required to undertake an individual assessment but again that should not be considered a core treatment for hand osteoarthritis but an adjunct to those other three core pillars. So starting with the, the pillars of obviously exercise and obviously weight loss is often not as much of an issue in the hand but exercise and self-management but particularly um, I think the assistive devices and those sorts of things can be quite beneficial in the hand and so should be considered for patients who aren't responding um, well to those initial core treatments. And Rana, is the prescription of the aerobic um, exercise for the purposes of weight loss? 
Actually, it's no. It's it, it can be for weight loss, but even for a person who is of healthy body weight, physical activity and aerobic exercise should also be part of the program. And that's just because we know that participating in an aerobic, we, well, we know that people with osteoarthritis have lower physical activity levels than their peers without osteoarthritis. And we know of the um, detrimental benefits of being less physical, physically active. But also participating in a general physical activity program has many systemic benefits for osteoarthritis, particularly from the psychosocial aspects and improved mood um, and improving um, muscle strength, balance and function um, as well. So yes, very important for people who are overweight, but still important for people who are of a healthy body weight. They should still be doing a physical activity and aerobic exercise program. And it's just a matter of working out what's the best program. Some people might like to cycle. Some people like to have a treadmill at home. That's how they like to exercise. Others might pr prefer to walk around the block and just work out an incidental walking program. Others might like to join a group class. But again, it's in, it needs to be individually um, negotiated um, with each person. Okay, what's the evidence on injection therapy for osteoarthritis in the knee or hip? Um, look, the evidence, um, certainly the corticosteroid injections have a place um, and you can if you want to, for a really thorough review of that evidence, I'd encourage you to look at the NICE clinical guidelines because that review is up to date as of last year. They have a place, but certainly, um, for example, uh, injections such as Synvisc, they're really not recommended because um, much of the evidence shows that there might be small short-term benefits that really disappear over time. So although some injections have a, pl a role to play after other drug strategies, um, injections such as uh, the hyaluronic acid, for example, are not recommended because there really is little evidence to show that they have a lot to offer. And one last question, which is often there's um, often lots of common things around um, what uh, what do you know or do you have an opinion on the ASICS OA shoe for knee OA? I do the, have the an brand opinion. ASICS. I do have an opinion because I was one of the um, that shoe developed out of our research here at um, the centre. So that was a shoe that has been developed on the back of biomechanical evidence. So we have um, sound biomechanical evidence that the ASICS OA shoe can reduce um, the amount of loading going across the knee joint by about five to six percent. So we know that, um, and we know that loading plays a role in. Um, osteoarthritis um, in the pathogenesis of the disease. We are about eight weeks away from um, wrapping up a clinical trial that is in 164 people that will has been evaluating the effect of that OA shoe on symptoms of pain and function in people with knee OA. Um, I can't tell you what the outcome of that is because I don't know. We have to keep everything blinded and the stat statisticians will do the stats blinded. So what I can tell you is that there is a clear biomechanical effect of the shoe um, in reducing load. Whether that will translate across to a clinical benefit in terms of reductions in pain and function, we need to wait for the close out of our trial to answer that question. We've got one last question, but I'll have to leave it there because we're going to finish, as I sort of said, strictly on 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Rana, thank you so much. That was just so much food for thought, so clearly presented, um, and I'm sure people will be able to benefit a lot in thinking about their daily practice in, in, in um, having those resources and, and thinking about how they then sort of work with their patients with OA. So thanks very much, Rana. Uh, could I ask everyone to complete the exit survey which will come up on your screens in a few moments and hopefully you'll tune in for our next webinar which will be in November on the 26th of November and it will be on the management of back pain. Thanks everyone and thanks very much Rana. Have a good afternoon. Bye.